Okay, good afternoon. I had assumed that we were starting at 4.30, so I thought I had a lot of time, but <laughs> you got an extra 15 minutes of rest. Uh, so um, I decided to uh, talk about the things that I got lots of questions yesterday. So I really changed my talk this morning to kind of address the questions that were asked. Uh, so, uh, okay, uh, so people asked me for the note, lecture notes, so I posted them on my website here. You can copy this. And the first two are there. Uh, so I'm going to focus mostly on research topics in our lab. But I realized that yesterday we finished too early and I didn't get to the point uh, how we get the graphene Landau levels from uh, using uh, uh, Onsager's relations. So we'll do that, we'll finish that, do density of state, and then what we're going to do is uh, see how we can change the band structure in graphene with defects. What we do, we pluck out a single carbon atom and look around and see that there's huge, hugely different properties that occur near the vacancies. And one of them is what I'm going to start with. We can create an artificial atom that resembles atomic collapse in, uh, in real atoms. I'm going to tell you exactly what that means. Uh, and uh, the vacancy in the, develops a magnetic moment, which we can tune with either a, a curvature of the substrate or with an electric field. So it's an electrically tuned vacancy that is, that is condo screen, depending on the conditions. And uh, the last part will be, I'm going to be talking about flat bands in twisted bilayers and how they develop correlated phenomena. In particular, I'm going to show you the latest results on superconductivity and insulating phase. So let's get started. So this is uh, what I'm going to talk about, starting with uh, finishing up yesterday's session on density of state and Landau levels in graphene from Onsager, and then we're going to be moving on to how we do experiments, scanning, tunneling, microscopy, and spectroscopy. And then I'm going to bring uh, examples of modifying the density of states with vacancy and with another substrate, with a moiré pattern. <clears throat> OK, so let's get started. Uh, so remember from yesterday, graphene is uh, sp2 hybridized carbon. Uh, and the, there are three ingredients that go into its unusual band structure, two-dimensionality, honeycomb structure, and uh, the fact that we have identical atoms on the two sublattices. This gives rise to this band structure, which consists of two Dirac cones that are related by time reversal symmetry to each other at the k and k prime points. Uh, at the Dirac point here, which is at which where the Fermi energy sits at charge neutrality, uh, the, the conduction and valence band touch at one point. Uh, the dispersion at low energy is linear in momentum, and the prefactor is the Fermi velocity, which is about 300 times slower than the speed of light. And the, the quasi-particles as I've shown you yesterday are chiral or helical, and they have a per and their uh, the pseudo spin is either aligned or uh, counter-aligned with the local momentum. And that gives rise to very long mean free path and to the absence of backscattering. Uh, in addition, it has a Berry phase of pi, which is very important for many things. But for one of, one of the things for which it is important, as I'm going to show in a moment, is for the Landau level sequence. Now, if you calculate the density of states, uh, now this is a little exercise which I have on my next slide. Uh, but unless you ask me, I'm not going to show it. If you really want to see the, the uh, derivation of this, come to me in, in the break. Uh, so it's a pretty straightforward derivation. But the bottom line is the density of state, the number of available states at a given energy in a, in a unit uh, area, per unit area, is linear in energy. And it vanishes at the Dirac point. And this is very important, because when you sit at the Dirac point, the density of state is zero. There's no room for an electron to sit there, essentially. Um, 
So we can, and because the density of state is so small and linear in energy, we can tune it with a gate. It's very easy to do it. You cannot do it in regular metals where the bands are flat. But here we can very easily tune it, and we make a device like this. Okay. Uh, this is a, dev a typical device that one looks at. So it's silicon substrate, uh, it's doped silicon, and we have 300 nanometer of insulating silicon dioxide. Graphene sits on top, we have some electrodes on top. You apply a gate voltage, and that allows you that basically it's like a capacitor, it's capacitive charging, but because the density of state is so small, a little bit of voltage already moves your Fermi energy along the, along the band. Let me repeat the animation here. So I'm gating it, positive gate, I'm moving in the electron sector, negative gate, I'm moving in the whole sector, completely smooth. I can really change the Fermi energy, you cannot do this in regular metals. Uh, because the densities of states are much too high. Uh, and this is how much it takes. One volt buys you seven times 10 to the 10th carriers per centimeter squared. That's a lot. So you can really move the Fermi energy. And we use that in all our experiments. Okay, here's the derivation. I'm gonna skip it, okay. Uh, okay, so now let's go back to Onsager relation. Yesterday we derived the Onsager relation, and that tells us that uh, the area of the nth cyclotron orbit in reciprocal space multiplied by the magnetic length squared is 2 pi times uh, an integer n, and these are the corrections that come from quantum mechanics. One half comes from the zero point energy, and this gamma is the Berry phase. Now, for graphene, the very face is pi, so look what's happening. A gamma over two pi is a half, so the very face completely swallows the zero point energy. No more zero point energy. Okay, so the bottom line is that now it's two pi n. The uh, Onsager relation on the right hand side is two pi n, n is the number of, uh, the, uh, of the cycloton orbit. <coughs> the order of cyclotron orbit. So if you take a circular orbit, you get that pi k n squared, uh, L b squared is two pi n, and you can immediately write, uh, derive what k n is, it's just proportional to square root of two n, and then plug it in in the dispersion, and you immediately get that the Landau level sequence, and notice what it looks like. Um, so this is h bar vf over the magnetic length. You can write, rewrite vf over magnetic length as a, as a frequency. It's, so that's, it's an effective cyclotron frequency. Remember, lb is h bar over eb. It's inversely proportional to the square root of the field. So the bottom line is that the sequence of Landau levels in graphene goes like square root of the Landau level index and like square root of the magnetic field. It's huge contrast with the Landau levels in non-relativistic e electrons. Uh, and notice, most importantly, it has a level at zero energy. You don't see that very much because, the, because of this Berry phase. It swallowed the zero point energy, so we do have a, a level at zero energy. <coughs> Uh, okay, so this is, I derived the energy uh, sequence, the Landau energy sequence using the Onsager relation. Now you can do the same thing using quantum mechanics. You can use the dirac weyl equation here. So this is, we have a two by two Hamiltonian. Uh, you go to the, you write down the, instead of the, uh, in the momentum, you write the canonical momentum here or mechanical momentum. And then you, you chug along solving it. It can be solved uh, pretty straightforwardly. You bring it to a harmonic oscillator form. It's a little bit more complicated, but in the, at the end of the day, what you get is the sequence of Landau levels, which is exactly, which is identical to the Landau levels we got from uh, the Onsager relation, okay? So the Landau level sequence looks like this. I'm drawing it here. So the, 
band structure has broken up into these Landau levels. There is one sitting right at zero here, and that one is very special because it's a consequence of this berry phase. It's a consequence of the chirality of these quasi-particles. And it's very special in many ways because um, remember the degeneracy of each level, of each level is the same. It's just equal to the number of flux lines that thread your sample uh, multiplied by the internal degree of freedom, which in this case is four, two for spin, two for value. Okay, so this is a degeneracy. This is how many electrons you can put in into each Landau level. So, but look, but notice here that on the negative energy side, it's holes, excitation, whereas on the positive energy side, we have electron excitation. But what's going on at n equals zero? Look what's going on. We have half electron, half holes, and they all are sitting at the same energy. So that is very promising. There's lots of things that can happen there. If you put your Fermi energy there, you can have, for example, exciton condensation. There are lots of interesting things that can happen that theorists predicted. Uh, maybe we've seen it, maybe we haven't, but, uh, but there, it's a promising place to go and look. Okay, so now let me compare this to the Landau levels in a non-relativistic system, because that's pretty instructive. So here is, we have a standard two-dimensional electron system in a semiconductor gallium arsenide. Sorry, yeah? What is the width of the Lorentzian? So um, this is a very good question. What is the width of the Lorentzian? Um, it is determined, I mean, if you go to zero temperature, if you have no random potential, it is still finite width. And that is electron-electron uh, interactions will determine that, yes. Um, and, and we have measured that, but I'm not going to talk about that, uh, but it's definitely to do with electron-electron interaction. So if, if there were no interaction, it would be a delta function, right? Uh, and I don't remember offhand what it is, and the, and the, the bandwidth depends on, on which Landau level you're in. Uh, and it's of the order of uh, one or two millivolts. But I, I sort of, I vaguely remember this. Okay, <clears throat> so here we have um, the non-relativistic electrons. So when, so the band structure is parabolic because we have a mass, uh, energy goes like p squared. Uh, now, but there's absolutely no reason in, norm, in these materials for to have electron hole symmetry. So you have a di the mass is a, the inverse of this curvature here. So you have no reason for them to be the same for the electrons and holes. Uh, the density of states uh, is flat. Uh, and again, because they're not symmetric, you have different density of state. Most importantly, you have a gap. This is a, these are electrons in semiconductors. And when you do Landau levels, the sequence is just a harmonic oscillator. It's linear in the Landau level index n and lin linear in magnetic field. Um, and there is a one half here, so you have no level at zero. There's this one half offset, they're all equally spaced. Another important difference is for a given material, you either have electron doping or hole doping, you can never have both. Another important difference is the Fermi energy sits wherever it wants to sit. You cannot change it. it sit, it's determined by the chemistry because the density of state is huge. You cannot do anything to it. Uh, and uh, let's contrast that with graphene. We have uh, electron hole symmetry. Uh, that is, if that is more or less true, this is almost true. Uh, it's, the, the <coughs> dispersion is linear in momentum, which means uh, these are ultra-relativistic quasi-particles. Um, density of state is linear, vanishes at the Dirac point here, and that's why we can gate it. Uh, the uh, uh, Landau level sequence goes like square root of the index and the magnetic field. So the higher you go in en energy, the tighter they go. The higher you go in field, the sparser they are. Uh, and we can walk on here with the gate. We can, we can actually probe every, every, every possible state here by, by gating the system. Very, very versatile. 
Uh, okay, so let me summarize the, uh, so uh, the, there is a Landau level at zero energy in graphene, and that is a, a reflection of the Berry phase of pi. Uh, it's electron hole symmetric, more or less. Energy and goes like square root of n, square root of v. And the, degeneracy, the internal degeneracy is 4 for spin and valley. To contrast that with non-relativistic electrons, uh, there is a gap at zero energy, and that is because the Berry phase is zero. It's a trivial system. Uh, equally spaced levels. The levels are linear in, in magnetic field, and the degeneracy is two. Internal degeneracy is two because there's just spin there. Okay, and these are some numbers. So the, the, actually, these are interesting numbers. Um, the spacing between the first zeroth and first Landau level is about 33 millivolt times square root of B. So if you're at, at one Tesla, uh, the spacing is 33 millivolt, and that is roughly room temperature, which means that in principle, uh, not only in principle, also in practice, you can see the quantum Hall effect at room temperature in graphene. Quantum Hall effect, which I didn't talk about, is when you put your Landau with your Fermi energy in the gap between two Landau levels. That's when you get these edge states that are perfect conductors. Uh, and there's a lot of room to put, uh, because of this huge number here, it's very easy to do, to see uh, integer quantum Hall effect at room temperature. People have done that. Uh, you can see fractional quantum Hall effect at very reasonable temperatures. Uh, we've seen it at, four, at, at 12 Tesla. We've already seen it at uh, 4 Kelvin. Uh, and in normal standard two decks, you have to go to the magnet lab to 30 Tesla to see, to see the fractional quantum Hall effect. Yes? Is there a way, there a way to tilt it? Uh, yeah, yeah, to make it uh, asymmetric, sure, yes. What? It, you, you, can, you can do these things by stretching, uh, you know, you change the hopping parameters. Uh, by, but you will not lose the Dirac point, but you will lose, uh, I mean, there's, there's several ways of doing this. For example, if you put it on a, on a externally, on, on a, you put it on stripes, so you make a periodic potential that's striped. You're going to get the velocity that is along the stripe is dramatically reduced perpendicular to the stripe. It remains the same. This is equivalent to having a tilt, right? Because the, velo the Fermi velocity is the slope of the cone. Yeah, you, yeah. yeah, you can make it. If you make it anisotropic. Now, what do you mean by, by tilting? When you tilt it, you have different slopes in different directions. That's exactly what I was talking about, right? No, 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 but this is... The story is very changes. When you, this was working for the special condition that, that I gave you, the three conditions. If you add stuff like asymmetry and all sorts of things, things become murky. No, you cannot just think in terms of the Dirac equation anymore. You can do a you know, perturbation theory depends how strong your, your perturbation is, yes. Otherwise, you have to start from scratch. Okay. Uh, okay, so how do we populate lambda level? Okay, so let's say that I have a, a, a two-dimensional sample, a perpendicular magnetic field. If I, if I want to throw in electrons, I have to remember that the, the wave function has to be single-valued, and then I just, it's a very nice way to interpret that you break up the magnetic field into uh, flux lines. So instead of this having one magnetic field, I'm breaking it up, the same flux, into, into, into this uh, array of flux lines. Uh, each one takes up a, a, a circle that, that, whose radius is the magnetic length, 25 nanometers times square root of B. <coughs> uh, 
uh, each one carries a flux, a fundamental unit of flux. Uh, each flux sign corresponds to an electronic state, so you can put one electron there, multiplied by the degeneracy, so you can put two electrons for two spins, or four electrons for two spin and two valleys. So each of these flux lines accommodates four electrons in graphene. Okay? So the orbital degeneracy gives you the number of flux line. The internal degeneracy gives you spin and valley here. So it's four. So this is how many we have. So now I'm going, I'm turning on my gate and I'm going to throw in electrons. Where do they go? So each one can take up, or each four take up a spot. And that's it. I finished filling up the, this Landau level. There's no more room for the next electron. Next electron has nowhere to go. So what does it do? It goes to the next Landau level. Now we have, two, we have a node in the wave function. And again, I can fill it up. And this, the distance here is h bar omega c. And now I can fill it again. And then I, my next electron is going to have to go to the next Landau level, which has three nodes in it, and so on and so forth. So this is how we fill, uh, how we gate, how we fill the Landau level. Uh, so the number of fill Landau levels is equal to the total number of electrons divided by the total degeneracy. Um, and the, the number of electrons per flux line is the number, total number of electrons divided by the, by the orbital degeneracy. Okay? It's just <clears throat> so uh, here is a summary of this stuff. Uh, okay, so the quantum unit of flux is a very small number here. Uh, it's expressed in fundamental units, a uh, Planck's constant and electron charge. Uh, the flux enclosed by a cyclotron orbit is, uh, has, has to be an integer multiple of the fundamental unit of flux. Uh, Onsager relation is the k-space area of the cyclotron orbit times magnetic length square is 2 pi times the index of the orbit plus one half for zero point energy minus the Berry phase in units of two pi. And that allows us to find the Landau level sequence for all sorts of systems if we know the dispersion. So we've shown that for non-relativistic electrons, we get the sequence uh, which looks like harmonic oscillator. Uh, and I mix the two up. This should be two here and this should be four. And for graphene, we got the sequence which has a Landau level at zero energy. The sequence goes like square root of field and uh, Landau level index. Uh, and the degeneracy is internal degeneracy times orbital degeneracy. The two should go here and the four should go here. Okay? Okay. Yes? Hmm? No, 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 this is area in k space, right? This is area in k space, so it's one over length squared. So multiply by length squared, it's a number, right? Right, okay. Yes? Uh, you, I have done it yesterday. Uh, look at the notes. If not, you can come down and ask me in the break, okay? I think I've done it yesterday. <laughs> if not, we'll talk later. I can't do it on the spot here. Uh, OK, any other questions? Yes? Can you speak up? No, and I remember I didn't do it yesterday. It's in the notes that 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 when when you solve for the Landau levels, the when you solve the harmonic oscillator Hamiltonian, that's where it comes out because you write your length. You want to write something in dimensionless unit, and the natural unit that comes out uh, is uh, is the magnetic length. I think I've done it. Uh, if not, I can put in my notes. But if not, come down and I'll I'll show you. Yes. 
So, uh, disorder doesn't play any role to broaden the Landau levels here for graphene? You said only it is electron electron repulse, ah, and we do that. That's a job. very good question. What's the role of disorder? Uh, and I have a whole lecture about that. It's huge. So, so okay, the bottom line is the following. Uh, it, the, as long as the magnetic length is small compared to the length scale of the disorder, they don't care. Okay, so as long as you can fit uh, a flux line in a region that is roughly flat, you're going to see uh, at least one or two Landau levels. If the disorder is on the order, of, if the disorder, so there's two, two, two energy scales. There is the energy scale of the disorder, the fluctuation of the potential. If that is large, comparable or large to the Landau level spacing, you're going to mess up your Landau level. Uh, then, then there is the, or the length scale that's determined by mag magnetic length. If the, if the orbit encompasses you know, some of those things, you're going to mess up your Landau levels. But, but otherwise, so, so you know roughly the conditions for this to work. These are also the conditions for, having, uh, for observing the quantum Hall effect. <clears throat> Any other questions? Okay, so we're done now with yesterday's lecture, so let's move to today's. Okay, so now I'm going to tell you just a little bit about, about our technique. I know most of you are theorists, so this is going to be fascinating for you. Okay, scanning tunneling microscope. It's a very, very simple device. Actually, uh, you, this is a high school project. Uh, you can actually build your own STM for about $50. Okay, so the idea is the following. Uh, take a sharp metallic tip, uh, okay, and bring it close to a surface, put in a battery <coughs> and uh, an ammeter to measure current, and you bring it closer and closer and in, until you start seeing a current here, and that's when you stop. Okay, now you have to make sure that you don't actually touch the surface. <clears throat> so that's how you do it. Now, the current that flows here is given by this expression here. It depends on two parameters, uh, on the density of state in your substrate. There's a density of state in a tip, which I'm taking out as a constant. We are assuming a flat band for the tip. And this is multiplied. This is a, comes from a matrix element, but the bottom line is that it has an exponential dependent on the height here because this is, after all, it's tunneling through a barrier. So it has an exponential dependence on the height here. Okay, so this is the current is given by these two, uh, by these two quantities, and then you have to integrate from zero from your Fermi energy to the bias voltage to get the current. So. Um, so, for example, if I have a bias volt, so this is, if this is the tip uh, band structure and this is my sample band structure, you're going to tunnel from the tip into available states in your, in your sample. So you can actually uh, move this, this whole thing by applying a bias. So if the bias is zero, this whole structure is going to move up. If it's finite, if it's Positive, it's moved down. Negative, it moves up. So you have electrons coming from the Fermi energy. This is not true here. It's mainly from the Fermi energy. And then you can actually see each one of these peaks showing up in your spectrum. Uh, OK? So uh, uh, OK, so there's two measurements that we can do with SDM, just basically two, and that's about it. So the first measurement is uh, to called topography. What we do, we keep, uh, we keep that, the, um, we uh, keep the height of the, we make sure that we keep the current constant, sorry. We keep the current constant by, we have a feedback. So if the, because of this exponential dependent, I can put a motor to, that makes sure if, I'm, if the surface is close to the tip, I can lift the, the tip uh, if it's, because the current goes down and vice versa. So I have a motor of feedback that 
uh, actually follows the, the topography of the sample because of this exponential dependence is extremely sensitive. So what you do, you raster the sample and you make sure the current is constant and you then measure or you map the amount of how much you need to change the height of the tip. And that gives you a picture like this and this is actual graphene. Every corner here is a, uh, is a graphene atom. Uh, now, the other measurement that you can do is you can go into this integral here and you can measure the density of state. The way to do this, you take the derivative of the current with respect to the bias voltage. That gives you the density of state and you make sure that the height doesn't change. You sit in a fixed point, fixed height, and that gives you t spectroscopy and then you can get the density of state as a function of, of energy by changing the bias. So this is, for example, uh, graphene as with a lot of disorder. This is graphene silic on silicon dioxide and the density of state. This is supposed to be the density of state. It doesn't look anything like what I showed you, like the linear, nicely linear dependence that vanishes at the Dirac point. Okay? So now, uh, as you have actually brought me into this topic, uh, what you see in the density of state when you look at graphene is hugely influenced by the environment, in particular the substrate. So if you have a crappy substrate with a, with a lot of random potential with charging, you're, gonna, you're not going to see anything that looks like what you expect from theory. Now the best kind of substrate to use for, graph, for graphene, can anybody guess what it is? The smoothest, flattest, most beautiful substrate? What? suspended. Uh, excellent. Very good point. So we tried that. It, the problem is that you, when you suspend graphene, uh, it's a membrane. It's a very stiff membrane. And we come with your tip, it has a normal mode, it has drum modes, and it, it shakes like crazy. So there's a lot of noise in your, in your signal, and there are ways to get around it, but absolutely best would be suspended, but it's tough. The next best Yeah, 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 something that is kind of similar. The most similar is graphite. They so put graphene on graphite and you get the best possible results. Okay, this is our, our STM. It's all home built because we are cheap. We can't spend so everything was home built here. Uh, so this it goes down to 2 Kelvin, we have a magnet, this was not home built, 15 Tesla, and we, we have a coarse motor that allows us to scan a millimeter, but then we can zoom into subatomic resolution. Uh, okay, so we can measure topography, we can do spectroscopy, density of state at zero field, we can apply magnetic field and look at Landau levels. And we use graphite as a substrate. And this is a topography which I showed you before, absolutely perfect. You can go like microns and not find a single defect. Um, now this is density of state, it's beautiful linear density of state in, as a function of energy. Here is the Dirac point. Uh, the Dirac point is the minimum here. The Fermi energy in STM is always zero. So in this particular sample, we have a little bit of hole doping. Fermi energy is below the Dirac point, and it's very nice that you can separate the physics of the two. And finally, we apply a magnetic field and look at these beautiful Landau levels. N equals zero, N equals one, two, three, and we're going up to, I think, seven on both sides. Now, what information can we get out? So here, uh, by, in a zero field, we can find the local doping and it changes. If you have a rough substrate, this fluctuates a lot. Uh, and we can find electron-phonon coupling. This, these are these two wings here that we find. I'm not going to discuss it. There is a con anomaly there that you can see. Um, in the Landau level sequence, you fit this and it fits beautifully. You can extract the Fermi velocity. And you can measure the local Fermi velocity from point to point. <clears throat> From that, we extract the quasi-particle lifetime with a few millivolts, uh, and you can extract the coupling strength to the substrate. So there's, it's a very useful and, and useful tool, yes? I have a question about graphene and graphite. When you put a layer of graphene on graphite, does it just get more graphite? 
Excellent question, excellent question. Uh, I was wondering if someone is going to wake up to this. Okay, I mean, this is like an oxymoron, right? Graphene on graphite. So normally, you saw the, the video yesterday, what we do, we peel, we take scotch tape and we peel off a layer of graphene and we separate, that's beautiful. It turns out that if you look at what's left behind after you peel the graphite, uh, quite often you will find a layer of graphene sitting on top that is decoupled, electronically decoupled. So the, the, the distance in, when in equilibrium in graphite, the distance between layers, it's about 0.3 nanometers. Okay, now you find a layer that is 0.32 nanometers. It's like 10% off. And because the coupling is, depends on tunneling, it's completely electronically decoupled. So it kind of floats on it, and there's no tunneling down into the graphite. So that's what we are looking at. It's a decoupled layer. So, so in a sense, it's, it, I mean, it, it kind of, by accident, you, we found it. Uh, but we, these are the best results that we got. OK. So now I'm going to the next topic. It's, so, so far, we've discussed perfect graphene. And now the question is, OK, let's mess up the graphene a little bit. Let's put in defects. So what we're going to do is we're going to pluck out a carbon atom and see what happens. Um, OK. So let's talk about magnetism. Uh, in a moment, you're going to see why. So magnetic materials uh, typically uh, are characterized by having uh, a, a, a localized electrons in partially filled inner D or F shells. So most of the magnetic materials have D or F shells. Uh, now, carbon doesn't have D or F. It just have, has pi shells. Uh, has P shell, has a partially filled P shell. Now, partially filled P shell, Hund's rule, uh, the carbon atom is magnetic. However, when you make a compound out of carbon, graphite, or any kind of sp2 compound, uh, nanotubes, uh, graphene, uh, graphite, uh, it's absolutely not magnetic. In fact, it is quite diamagnetic. It's one of the most diamagnetic materials we know. You can actually levitate a magnet with, uh, with graphite. Um, so it's one of the most diamagnetic materials that we know, and the question is why. And the answer was given a long time ago by Elliot Lipp, uh, who is who told us that if you have a repulsive Hubbard model with a bipartite lattice, I'm going to translate this, uh, and a half-filled band, the spin of the ground state with Na and Nb populated site is one-half times the difference in population. Now, what does bipartite mean? Bipartite means exactly this lattice where you can take two colors, uh, red and green, and you, cut, and you color your lattice so that uh, every red atom has only green atoms around it, and every green atom has only red ones about it. And this is true for all the uh, square lattices, for example, three dimensions or two dimensions. Um, it's not true, of course, for triangular lattices. So if you have a bipartite lattice and you put the Hubbard model on it, it's, and it's half filled, as graphene would be at, at the at charge neutrality, uh, so if you have Na atoms on sublattice A and Nb atoms on sublattice, sublattice B, the spin of the whole sample is very simple given by one half times the difference in population. So if you take, if you take perfect graphene, pristine graphene, where Na is usually equal to Nb, you must have spin equals to zero. It's going to be non-magnetic. So, um, in the, at the beginning of this millennium, in the year 2000, people started reporting having found magnetism in graphite, in, in uh, uh, buckyballs, uh, and all sorts of samples that came from meteors. And there was huge controversies. So, so these people were, were, were told that they're either lying or that they don't know what they're doing. Uh, one of the papers that was published by Tatiana Makarova and collaborators in 2000 uh, in Nature, 
he was forced to retract the paper uh, because people said, you, you know, it's not really graphite that's magnetic. It's, you have some impurities. You're not careful of how you handle your tweezers. And it was retracted. So, so this is how, and, and people really felt very strongly about it because they didn't read Lieb, the small print in Lieb theorem. Because, OK, you, uh, perfect graph, graphite cannot be magnetic. However, all you need to do is to, uh, uh, um, to unbalance it. So you can do that by making holes, by plucking out a carbon atom, or you can do that by cutting the edges. You have zigzag edges. It'll be one side is going to have spin up, the other side is going to have spin down. Uh, actually, it's kind of neat. Go Google diamagnetic materials and check which one of these satisfies Lib theorem. It's kind of fun. Many of them do, actually. Uh, okay, so people woke up to the fact to Lib theorem, and then there's lots of theoretical papers that started to show, okay, if you have defects, if you have vacancies, you can make graphene magnetic. <clears throat> uh, okay, so let's make, let's try to make graphene magnetic. We're going to pluck out uh, one carbon atom, make a vacancy, and see what that does to uh, the band structure. Uh, or into the density of state. So here we have perfect graphene. This is the density of state of perfect graphene. Linear density of state vanishes at the Dirac point. And now I'm going to pluck out one carbon atom. What happens? So you plug out one carbon atom. You've taken away four electrons, right? You've taken three away three sigma electrons that bind to the neighbors and one pi electron in the pi orbital, OK? So here we removed it, and what we have is going to have degenerate bands here, the sigma bands. So, so you have the sigma, the, the sigma bands from the uh, bonds that were left behind, the dangling bonds, are sitting way down here. And the pi bond, you have a localized, you have a localized state that sits at the Dirac point. Okay? That's from the missing electron in the pi band. So in the pi band, that, that would be your lib electron, because that electron is missing its brother. So it, 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 uh, it upset the balance. These electrons lib didn't talk about. Uh, uh, OK, so that, but then there is a crystal uh, distortion, a Jan Teller distortion, and things get a little bit uh, more complicated. So two of these uh, bonds hybridize. So you have, and so this is the, from the Jan Teller distortion, and the third one is, uh, this, you have a third or orbital from this electron that stays uh, hanging alone, okay? So this one has a spin of a half. So you have a dangling bond that carries a spin of a half, okay? Now what about the missing electron in the pi band? So the missing electron in the pi band, there's a kind of, almost delocalized state here. It's sitting around the uh, Fermi energy, and that also has a spin of a half, OK? So that gives you the missing pi electron gives you a quasi-localized state on the other sublattice. So if I plucked out a carbon from the A sublattice, I'm going to have a quasi-delocalized state on the B sublattice. And this carries uh, not a full Bohr magneton, somewhere between a half and 0.7 because of the spreading out and the interaction with the other electrons. So now the density of state, what happens, this is the original, this is calculated density of state. Um, and I don't know why all these wiggles, they probably didn't do enough. Uh, uh, actually, I don't know why these wiggles. Um, but what you have here, this pi electron, um, state gives you a peak at the density of state. And that peak is sitting as that peak is sitting at the Dirac point and it is a manifestation of the broken AB symmetry. And the more you break it, the more it's gonna move actually. So this is a manifestation of broken symmetry. When you charge it, this peak is gonna move. Uh, okay, so vacancy properties. So uh, it has a magnetic moment, and looking at the vacancy gives us the opportunity, a unique opportunity, to study the interaction of ultra-relativistic electrons with magnetic moments. Can't do it in any other system. Uh, now, there's another part to this story. The vacancy carries a charge. 
And I'm not going to show you the calculations, but I'm going to show you a little bit later. Uh, it carries a charge of plus one electron that is spread out on this vacancy here. So this was, uh, this was done by DFT calculations. So that gives us the opportunity to study the interaction of ultra-relativistic electrons with a point charge. Lots of good physics that one can do here. Okay, so I'm going to talk now about interaction with charge. Okay, so remember a Klein tunneling. I told you that it's impossible to confine electrons in graphene with electrostatic potential. And this was the cartoon that I showed. So the electron turns into a hole under the barrier and turns back into an electron and there's no, because there's no backscattering. Okay? So basically we cannot confine the electrons, uh, not in a simple way anyway. Uh, so the question is, can we, can we use a very strong charge, a local point charge, to, to actually confine the electrons? So that's the question. Can you use a point charge to control the carriers? A point charge which now we know we can create by plucking out a carbon atom. Okay, so here I need to talk, to remind you a little bit about what happens when you have an electron interacting with a proton or with a charge Z. <laughs> so we start with classical physics. So I have an electron and charge Z. The non-relativistic classical case, you have kinetic energy P squared over 2M and potential energy Z e squared over R. And we know that in classical physics, the electron is just going to fall into the, uh, into the nucleus. There's absolutely nothing to stop it from just going in there. Okay? So there's no uh, uh, bound state solution. Now let's go to not quite quantum mechanics. I'm going to go to semi-classical approximation. And when you do a semi-classical approximation, all you have to do is the trick is replace P by H bar over R, and there you are. So I'm replacing the kinetic energy by H bar over R. And, the, uh, and now, now this doesn't look anything like what I showed you because I'm using dimensionless unit. I'm going to show you in a moment what they are. So basically now the energy is mc squared. I like that because that's easy to remember. Times a rho is a length. Um, and let me show you what I've done here. So I'm expressing the distance in units of the Compton wavelength. So this is a characteristic length scale in the problem. So that I'm calling that rho. I'm expressing the charge here in terms of the Coulomb coupling constant, which is the charge times the fine structure constant. Now the fine structure constant is the measure of the strength of the Coulomb interaction uh, compared to the zero point energy. So the fine structure constant is a tiny, tiny number. Uh, in our world. It's only 1 over 137, and we are lucky for that. Uh, so I'm a, I'm, everything here is expressed in dimensionless units and fundamental constant. Now you see the kinetic energy is 1 over rho squared, so it, it grows as you come to the origin here. Uh, the potential, so the potential energy here is negative, it goes like 1 over rho, so basically you have a minimum. And the minimum happens exactly at the Bohr radius, uh, which is the Compton length, simply the Compton length and divided by the, by the charge, by the Coulomb coupling constant. So that's our Bohr radius. And then you have the Rydberg, which gives you the energy scale, which is this minimum here. It is one half mc squared beta squared. I really like this way of writing it because I can never remember it, e, where e and h bar and all that goes. Here, just mc squared times the charge squared. So that's the Rydberg. So now you have a nice bound state and you have a Rydberg skier. So you need the quantum mechanics in order to have stable atoms, as we all know. So now this, all this works beautifully when I'm starting from classical physics, from non-relativistic physics, and when beta is very small and my Rydberg is very small, I'm sitting out here, everything works nice because the energy scale here is much smaller than the rest energy of the electron, so I don't need to take that into account. It's completely outside a different scale. I don't need to take into account relativistic effects. 
Now let's go towards heavier and heavier atoms. You go down uh, the, ta the periodic table. Z becomes larger and larger. ER becomes larger and larger. And what will happen is the Bohr radius becomes smaller and smaller. You get closer and closer to the nucleus. And eventually, eventually your energy, your Rydberg becomes comparable to the zero, the, the, the uh, rest energy of the electron. So all our, our starting point is completely wrong. We have to start from relativistic physics. Um, uh, because here, he, soon enough, this is going to fall into the Dirac continuum. Can't happen, right? So we need to use relativity to describe, describe this problem. So in, to use relativity, all you do is basically add the rest energy of the electron, mc squared. So let's see how that changes the story. So now I'm going to, instead of writing p squared over 2m, I'm going to replace that by the relativistic expression here. Uh, okay, so this is what it was without relativity. When I add relativity, uh, all that changed here, I have a one here, which is, comes from the, MC, from the rest mass. Okay, and how does the Bohr radius change? Uh, there, is a min there is a minus, so there's a one, square root of one minus beta square here, which comes into the Rydberg as well. So you might think, okay, so why, why should I care about this? Well, in fact, it's immediately obvious that you should care about this because what happens when beta becomes one or larger than one? There's no solutions, right? So Dirac noticed that a long time ago, said this, uh, when, when you have a charge of 137, uh, so you, you have an atomic number of 137, all hell breaks loose, the solutions are no, there are no solutions basically, they are imaginary. Uh, so they thought so there's a bunch of Pomeranschut uh, uh, and Swarovski and, uh, uh, and somebody else whose name I didn't write down, um, Zel Zeldovich, right. They, they fix this. They fix this by regularizing the potential. They say, okay, the electron comes very close to the nucleus, but it can't get in, so let's put a cutoff, which is the size of the nucleus, and that doesn't, doesn't give you imaginary solutions. Um, it gives you, so then you, the, the solutions survive until 170, but this is what happens with the Rydberg series as a function of z. So here, this is where the normal periodic table lives, okay? So this is our 1s state, this is a 2s state, and you see when you start having heavy, heavier and heavier nuclei, the 1s, all the levels start dropping down. And that's okay until they drop into the uh, Dirac continuum, and that's when you have the so-called atomic collapse. So at, at about 170, in principle, the periodic table should end, and what happens there, it falls in there, and what happens, the electron falls in the nucleus, it merges with a proton and becomes a, a neutron, and you, and you emit a, a, a positron. So, and that goes to infinity. Now, our friends in nuclear physics have been doing colliding heavy, heavy ions for decades, trying to look for the spontaneous generation of, of positrons when, when you have atomic collapse, and that never worked because, you know, we don't, you don't have such heavy, heavy nuclei. Okay, so, so what's very, it's very interesting to see if you add relativity to quantum mechanics, the atom again collapses at a critical charge. Okay, and uh, I don't know if you know that, but the, the uh, this is the last element in our periodic table. It's called Ununoctium, 118. I think it now has a name, actual name. I don't know what it is. <clears throat> okay. Okay, so now what happens in, uh, in graphene? So here we have a mass. We have a finite mass. So we have a mass gap in the spectrum. And I want to take this to graphene, which means I have to take the mass to zero, I have to go to two dimensions, and I have to, to switch from the speed of light to the Fermi velocity. And when you do all that, 
uh, and you do all that through these relationship which I used before, you get um, the dispersion that looks like this. So the energy is h bar Vf over R, and there's one half minus beta here. One half comes from the angular momentum. Uh, so this is very interesting. Notice that there is no scale here. There's no characteristic. This is a scale-free problem. Whereas before we had the Bohr radius, we had a minimum. This thing doesn't have a minimum. Uh, it either goes to plus infinity or it goes to min minus infinity. No minimum. This is a typical scale-free problem. There are a few of those in nature. This is called an FMOF series. It, uh, uh, okay, so now let's put it here. Let's put graphene here. So E is h bar Vf over R times 1 half minus beta. Beta here is the Coulomb coupling constant for graphene. So Z is the charge. But the fine structure constant now has to be replaced. The effective fine structure constant for graphene has to be renormalized by the Fermi velocity. So you have to replace the speed of light by the Fermi velocity. And something amazing happens when you do that. You also need the dielectric constant here. The effective fine structure constant for graphene is 2. It's huge. So if we were made out of graphene, we, were not, we would not exist because there's no, there wouldn't be any periodic table. Uh, OK, so it's a scale-free problem. The critical charge now is 1. So you should already see collapse at 1. So now you see where I'm going. If I can put a charge of 1 on graphene, maybe I can see the, the effect of atomic collapse. Uh, OK, so, let's, so now let's take small charge. Beta is less than the critical. Uh, what we have, the, uh, the, end, the total energy as function of position goes like this. Remember, this is radius. So, um, uh, so uh, the electron just goes through. When it comes in from infinity, it just goes through there. It's, not, it's, not, uh, uh, it's basically re not doing anything. It's not seeing it. So basically, oops. Uh, we have clearly we have no bound state. This is basically Klein tunneling. Okay, it just goes through, it doesn't see it, it doesn't get bound. Now what happens on the other side of this transition? This is a quantum phase transition because it's not driven by temperature, it's driven by a parameter in the problem. So what happens on the, on the other side of the transition? Now the, the total energy is negative and we get quasi-bound states uh, and uh, and we get these are kind of cha almost chaotic orbits. Uh, and this is a series that resembles the Rydberg series, but not quite, because this is a scale-free problem. So the sequence of energy is linear in log of the, of the energy, in, of the level index. It's linear in log of the level index because it's a scale-free problem. So this is the energy, the quasi-bound energy sequence. Uh, let me show you one more thing here, what's going on here. So this is our 1 over r potential. I'm writing, I'm, I'm showing both sides. And this is the, so when you are, when you, these Dirac points should, should be actually writing on top of the potential. I took this from this paper here, so this is wrong. So this should be here, and this one should be somewhere down here. But the bottom line is that the type of carriers is reversed when the Fermi energy crosses a Dirac point, as I've shown you in the Klein tunneling uh, example. So here we have uh, holes, electrons, holes. So sign of carriers is reversed. Um, and uh, so you have two, two radii, one radius of the orbit outside here, and another rate, uh, one or radius of the orbit inside, one for the orbit outside, and you have a centrifugal barrier in between them at R star. Okay, so, so basically, and, and things depend on angular momentum and so on. So one thing that I want you to notice is that the Klein tunneling coupling, couples electron-like state to hole-like state. So these are not really bound state. They will be quasi-bound state. So they extend a little bit outside. And this is a memory of the positron creation. OK, so that's the manifestation of the positron creation in atomic collapse is the fact that you have coupling. You have a broader, this is a quasi-bound state. And it kind of leaks out to infinity. 
<clears throat> so what is the experimental signature of atomic collapse in graphene? This is a simulation by my collaborators here. So when, so this is the energy as a function of beta. When you have, when beta is less than a half, you have unbound state, just Klein tunneling. And as beta is above a half, you're going to start having these collapse states. And this looks like an artificial atom, but this is not quite because the sequence is not a Rydberg series. But they, the, the levels start dropping down into the, uh, uh, into the uh, negative energy sector. Just to compare it to the atoms, this mass gap here, which you have in atoms, is absent in graphene. Okay, and the collapse here, but still the collapse happens on this side here when you go, this is the positron production here we have the, uh, when you go above the supercritical charge you have, uh, um, you have quasi-bound state. <clears throat> so in the 2013, uh, my chromis group at Berkeley, what they did is, okay, they tried to, tried to see this collapse. And it, it's very difficult to charge graphene. It just, everything becomes screened. So they piled up five calcium dimers, one on top of each other. It's, nobody ever reproduced this. This is a total feat because it's like a bomb. You know, they're charged. So they managed to bring them all together, five um, dimers. And they saw in the density of states, uh, this, is, uh, this is the Dirac point energy here. So as they, uh, as they come closer and closer to this complex, they saw a bound state just below the Dirac energy. And that they attributed to atomic collapsing graphene. And where were they? They were here. They were almost, you know, almost at the boundary here. Okay? So then we asked, can we do better? Uh, let's try to use a vacancy where we don't have to pile up charge. The vacancy is naturally charged. <clears throat> uh, so can one host a stable charge in graphene? The answer is yes. Uh, now the vacancy has two, has a, has two, meta, has two st a ground state and a metastable state. So the ground state has a charge of one where the graphene is flat. The metastable state is off by about 50 millivolts up here. You have the apical atom kind of sticking out. Now when we prepare our vacancies, as you'll see, we always prepare it in this state. So the vacancy is not charged. It has a spin, but it has no charge. And this is how we, how we prepare them. Um, so this is our STM. This is pristine graphene. We bombard this sample with uh, uh, with low energy helium ion, about 100 electron volts. And we create these spots here, and when you zoom in, you see this triangular structure, which is the, the signature of a single atom vacancy. Am I running out of time here? Uh, okay, let me go for... for at most five more minutes, OK? Uh, OK, so what's going on? So remember I talked about the zero mode, which has to do with the unpaired electron in the, in the pi band. And it gives you a state here. However, when you charge the vacancy, the zero mode very rapidly moves down. By, and the amount by which it moves down is a measure of the charge of the vacancy. So that's a very useful tool to have. So here is, um, and then if you continue charging it, then you should start seeing these, uh, these quasi-bound state after this thing dropped to out, out of sight. Uh, so this is, a, this is a, a spectrum of a vacancy that was just created. Here is the zero mode, and you see it, it sits right at zero. It hasn't moved at all. That means the vacancy has zero charge, almost zero charge. Okay, so what do we do next? So we were really, we didn't know about this metastable state. So we were very puzzled. Theorists tell us that it should be charged. We see nothing. So uh, Yuhan, my postdoc, decided to do something very brave and she started banging on that vacancy. So what she did, she applied voltage pulses to the vacancy site. And every pulse 
this zero mode moved down, which means that the thing started getting charged. And uh, so if we plot these, these points for every pulse, they just ride on top of the, and then we can, we can calculate what the charge is for with every pulse from the position of this peak. And then she continued to pulse it, and then there's a new sequence that appeared here that you can map onto this quasi-bound state. Uh, so, uh, so you charge it. This is atomic collapse. This is the atomic collapse in graphene. Uh, and uh, now, uh, if you look, it's very interesting now. So you say, oh, these are just peaks that are moving down, but they're qualitatively different. If you do topography, the zero mode is very tightly localized within two nanometers of the vacancies, whereas the collapse mode are, are really spread out, as you expect for a quasi-bound state. Uh, and last thing I'm going to show you is here, and we're going to look at the highest charge, which is about beta 1.09. And we're going to do maps, energy maps. So we are we are moving uh, as a function. We are move, we are, we are plot. What I'm plotting here is the density of state as a function of position as you move out from the center. And this is uncharged. Now, for an energy of um, at the 2s energy here, it looks like this. So this is where the, electro, where the wave function sits. So you can measure how big it is, about 15 nanometers. Then I'm moving to the energy of the 1s prime. 1s prime is a satellite peak, which has to do with the fact that you have a broken symmetry. Uh, with, you wouldn't have it with a charge that is not a vacancy without breaking the symmetry. And then there's the 1s. And 1s has a halo. And this is the, you know, this is the positron, if you like. This is the leaking out of the wave function into the whole side. So there we have a captured electron state with its halo. So basically, this gives us a mechanism to confine electrons in graphene. So you completely change the Hamiltonian, basically. And you can trap them. And this is the, really the last. Uh, and you can untrap them. So if you apply a gate voltage, so this is, I'm changing the carrier density. So this is beta as a function of carrier density. So as I approach the Dirac point, there's less and less screening, so the charge increases. But as soon as I'm on the other side, boom, the whole thing goes away. No more bound state, because the charge is negative. So basically, by moving with a little bit of voltage across here, we can trap them and let them go as, as we please at the vacancies. And, uh, so this is a summary of part of this part. So let me read it to you. So in quantum electrodynamics, the fine structure constant measure the strength of the electromagnetic interaction. And it is very, very weak. And that's why we have such a long periodic table. Uh, in graphene, the fine structure constant is huge. It's about 1. And therefore, we can see atomic collapse and probably other things as well. And we can ask many more questions. OK, break. <clears throat>
Okay. What? It would collapse like a <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anything possible. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Okay. Okay, welcome back. So now we're going to the last part, uh, and we're going to talk about the magnetic moment in, in graphene, uh, and in particular about the condo effect in graphene. <clears throat> okay, so if you have a... Uh, impurity, a magnetic impurity in a metal, in a standard metal, what happens, you get um, the electro, and you at a high temperature, it's, nothing happens to it. There's no screening. The magnetic moment is bare. However, in normal metals, when you reduce the temperature, there is a temperature below which the conduction electron forms a nice screening cloud here that completely hides the magnetic moment. And, what are the, and this is called condo screening. What are the conditions for this screening to happen? You have to have antiferromagnetic coupling between the conduction band and the impurity. This is usually the case. Um, and you have to have a finite density of state at the Fermi energy. And if, that, if these conditions are satisfied, you, this critical temperature below which the magnetic moment is dis going to disappear uh, it is exponential in 1 over the density of state and the coupling constant in the, um, in the sample between the impurity and the conduction electrons. So all you need is to have a finite density of state at the Fermi energy, and you need a positive coupling constant to have screening of magnetic moments. So if you look at an insulator, nor in normal metals, this is practically always the case. There's always some temperature below which your magnetic moments disappear. If you look at insulators, uh, the density of state at the Fermi energy is zero. You never, the magnetic moments survive to all temperatures. So the question to ask is graphene is kind of in between a metal and an insulator. The density of state at the, at the Dirac point, if you're at charge neutrality, is zero. Uh, however, if you just move epsilon away, it's finite. So what's going on there? So that's the question that people started asking in the 90s with the advent of high temperature superconductors that have Dirac points in their band structure. And this is what they came up with. There were lots and lots of theoretical works uh, that if you have a pseudo-gap system where the density of state is not flat, but it's a power law of the energy, uh, things uh, become kind of interesting. Uh, so if uh, the power is 1, as in graphene and in high TC superconductor, it turns out that if you sit at charge neutrality here, uh, condo screening can happen, but only above a critical coupling. In normal metal, a condo screening could, could happen at any coupling. In, if you have pseudo-gap system, there is a critical coupling above which you have screening, below which the system is unscreened. So if you move across here, this is a quantum phase transition, if you change your coupling constant. Now what happens if you have a finite doping? So you, you move up on the chemical potential, axis here. Uh, so you have a region, so below the critical coupling, you have a region where it's unscreened. And if it, you have sufficient electrons there, it's going to get charged, even though you're below the critical. This is, this is a critical regime here. <clears throat> so uh, if you're able to, if you're sitting somewhere here in a sample, uh, you can actually tune your magnetic moment with an electric field, with doping. So if I have a sample that sits here, uh, I can see the magnetic moment, I apply, a, I dope it, the magnetic moment is going to disappear. And this is kind of appealing because you, in principle you can have electrical control of, ma of magnetism. <clears throat> no, 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 there's a finite region here. And we know exactly, exactly how it behaves. Yeah, it's not any finite mu. There's a... But for, for a finite mu, you have a... 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. But this is still this is a this regime, this yellow regime. It's a kind of a critical regime, and the, the physics is totally different. Uh, look at all these guys. This is all discussed there, uh, and uh, I can tell you, TK. Well, okay. TK goes is uh, exponential in, in one side. It's it's a uh, it's a it goes like square of the so you're right. It's very small, but it goes like square of the dope of mu, and on the other side it goes like some exponent of mu. So it's not strictly speaking not zero, but well, I mean, the value okay. yeah yeah uh, theoretically you're absolutely right, but. For, for any realistic experimental sure. situation, you, you have this. So, so tr it's true. At zero temperature, you just have a line here. True. Now, experiments don't work at zero temperature, and these scales are exponential. So when we're at 4 Kelvin, I have a finite regime here. Yes. Um, OK, so what, how, what are the experiment, experimental signature of condo screening? Uh, this was found a long time ago. So you look at the resistivity uh, in a metal that has magnetic moments. So the resistivity goes down. Your phonons are freezing out. Uh, if it were a, a metal without magnetic impurities, it just, just goes to zero. If there are magnetic impurities, you hit the condo temperature scale, and the resistivity goes up. And the reason it goes up, you have this condo cloud that the electrons that provide extra scattering, and that scattering increases as you decrease the temperature. So the, the, the canonical signature of condo screening is a minimum as in the resistivity as a function of temperature. The second signature of condo screening is in magnetization. You, you, so Curie, the um, Curie behavior is uh, the susceptibility goes like 1 over T all the way down to the lowest temperatures. If you have, uh, if you have condo screening, it's saturated at the scale that is comparable to the condo temperature. And that saturation, again, has to do with the fact that you've screened out the magnetic moment of your impurity. And the third signature is a peak, a peak at, the, at the Fermi level. That peaks come from the fact that these electrons uh, are, that, that screen, the, screen your, your impurity all come from the Fermi energy. So, they, so they, you have a, an enhancement of the, uh, of the density of state at the Fermi energy that it sticks right, that it gives you a peak right at the Fermi energy. So what's the situation experimentally? In 2011, the uh, uh, Michael Fierer's group measured resistivity. They saw a minimum. So they made, made vacancies in graphene just as we do. And they me measured the resistivity of function of temperature. They saw a minimum. And then they said, OK, there is condo screening. So there is condo screening graphene, and we can measure it. Uh, one year later, the Manchester group did magnetization measurement, and they saw Curie behavior down to the lowest temperatures. So they said, no condo screening in graphene, impossible. And um, it's very interesting. The theorists sided with the Manchester group, and they tried to find reasons why uh, Fierce group is wrong. Uh, they were saying, oh, he's not seeing condo screening. All he's seeing is uh, localization. And uh, this kind of work was considered to be wrong. So we decided to try to look at the third signature to see if there is a peak, to, if we can find a, a peak at the Fermi energy. And here is the experiment. So we have a vacancy that we created, as I told you before. And we look with our STM. We go far from the vacancy. And we do look at the density of state. It kind of looks OK. This sample is graphene on silicon dioxide. The Dirac point is here. The Fermi energy is here. So we on purpose doped it so to show to show the, uh, to separate the Dirac point physics from the Fermi energy physics. So we hole doped it here with 2 times 10 to the 11 holes per centimeter square. And then we move to the center of the vacancy here. And this is what we see. Two peaks appear. One peak at the Dirac point, which we identify as the zero mode that we discussed before. And another peak right at the Fermi energy. This is our candidate for the condo peak. We need to check, but this is our candidate. OK, so what kind of checks do we do? 
first of all, we look at a function of position. It's very tightly. The peak appears only very close to the vacancy. You don't see it anywhere else. Uh, it's localized within two nanometers of the vacancy. Uh, we look at the line width and the line shape. This is a typical Fano line shape. Fano line shape, if you have a resonance within a, within a band, uh, the line shape has to be like this. And then you can fit it and extract the, con the, the from the width, you can extract the condo temperature, and we get about 70 degrees Kelvin. You can do an independent test by actually changing the temperature and looking at the behavior of the line widths and fitting to theory. Again, we get something that is consistent with the line width, about 68 Kelvin uh, within the error bar. So this is all very nice. So the next thing that we do, OK, but the P condor peak has to be stuck to the Fermi energy. Uh, so since we can dope the system, we can move the Fermi energy. So we can see if it's stuck there or not. Maybe this is an uh, artifact. So we dope it. So now we increase the chemical potential, um, minus 92 up to 73. This, this peak is completely stuck to the Fermi energy. The other peak is the zero mode. It kind of moves in. It moves in. Uh, so, uh, so this is our zero mode. So this is a good sign. This is, looks like a condo peak. And let's continue to dope it. So now, sorry, now this is inverted. Now I'm, dope, I'm increasing the doping downwards. This, this uh, graph is inverted, OK? So I'm getting closer to the Dirac point going this way. Uh, the peak, this is what I showed you before. It's just upside down. Condo screening is on. Now I'm moving closer to the Dirac point. No condo peak, OK? This is the Fermi energy. Condor peak completely disappeared. And I'm coming out on the other side, boom, it reappeared again. So what's going on here? Uh, so I can measure, I can extract the condor temperature. So on the hold up side, uh, there's condor screening. As I get closer to the rack point, the whole thing disappears, and then it reappears again. So that reminds us of the thing I showed you, that you move the chemical potential close to the critical coupling. Uh, so it looks like this has, this, this vacancy is below the critical coupling. Uh, and J is less than JC. Otherwise, it, you'd have condo screening everywhere. But this is, this is as much as we can do as experimentalists. In order to figure out what actual value of J is, we need help from theorists. So, but the bottom line is that you have an electrically tuned magnetic moment here. OK, I'm not going to go through this. This is all published. This is our, with our theory collaborator. So you have two orbitals. You have uh, the sigma orbitals, two families, and you have the pi orbitals. And when the Fermi energy changes, you get the two interaction. The problem is really messy with two orbitals. And uh, normalization. so our collaborators use normalization group calculation to calculate the, the uh, the band structure to calculate the uh, phase diagram. Uh, and there, one can approximate it as a, as with a single band, just with the sigma bonds, by doing this kind of approximation. I'm not going to go into it. I'm just going to show you the bottom line is the phase diagram that they got. <clears throat> so if you want to read about it, it's all published. So this is a phase diagram that we got chemical potential versus reduced coupling. So when at the critical coupling is sitting right here, so here you have the local magnetic moment. Here in the, the pink regions are condo screen. And here you have a frozen impurity. Basically, it's where you have double occupancy of the vacancy. Uh, <clears throat> of the, so you have a spin up and spin down sitting in that state. So the magnetic moment is, is disappearing. And now let's put our vacancy uh, on here. And, uh, and this is where it is. So the coupling was indeed less than critical, and it's 0.8 of the critical coupling. So then we looked at other vacancies. And all hell broke loose. We got coupling all over the map. Some, some vacancies were subcritical, some were supercritical, some were very close to the critical point. 
what's going on? Are we doing something wrong? Do we have irreproducible results? So, so that's the question. What, what's going on here? Why, do, why are they all different? So in order to understand that, let's go back and to figure out where this comes from. So we have one magnetic moment that comes from the dangling bond here. But that dangling bond is a sigma bond, and that's orthogonal to the pi electron. There should be no coupling. J should be 0. We cannot have screening. This, bond, this magnetic moment cannot be screened by the, by the conduction electron. J has to be 0 for this guy. Can't have condo screening of this moment. Now let's look at the other uh, moment that comes from the missing uh, electron in the pi band. But that one has ferromagnetic coupling to the, uh, to the band. So again, J should be 0. So the theorists, having sided with the Manchester group, based their arguments on this. They said there is no c the coupling has to be 0. Uh, and therefore, the transport measurements were wrong. So what's going on? We do see a condo screen. We do see a condo peak. There's no question about it. So what's going on? There's really a mystery going on here. So the rescue came from this group here. They said, oh, but you know, graphene is a membrane. It can, you know, it, it, it can bend if, you, if you're putting it on a substrate that is not flat, and your orbital, your sigma orbital is sticking out of the plane, then you should, you, you're able, there's no, the orthogonality is gone, and you should be able to, uh, to couple. You should have a finite coupling. So yes, we do have a corrugated substrate. So the coupling is actually a very simple function of the, the, the local curvature. OK, so, so then we did the experiment on all sorts of uh, substrate. So this is, not, this is on a graphene directly uh, uh, supported by silicon dioxide, which is very rough. Uh, and we can measure the height fluctuation with AFM. You get about 2 nanometers amplitude here along this line. And uh, in this sample here, we get a TK. The maximum TK is 180 Kelvin. It's huge coupling. And most, most of the vacancies we look at have a condo peak. Most of the vacancies are screened. Then we go to a slightly flatter substrate. Uh, so we have two layers, one, one, two layers of graphene, one on top of each other on silicon dioxide. And now the corrugation is about half as high. TK is about half, right? It's about 70. And only 30% of the vacancies show condo screening. And finally, we go to boron nitride, which is the flattest. It's about 10 times flatter. No condo screening. Not, not, not a single vacancy shows condo screening. So everybody was right, in a sense. This. So, um, so the J depends on local corrugation. And we have, uh, so in a sense, we have a mechanically controlled magnetism, not, not by electric field, by mechanically controlled. Now let's go back to the experiments, to Fira versus Manchester. The thing is that when you do a global measurement, you're doing an average over all these magnetic moments and all, all their screening. You don't see individual ones. So transport and magnetization measure complementary properties. When you do transport, what you're looking at is screening off the condo, is scattering off the condo cloud. If, there's no, if there is a condo cloud there, you're going to see it. You're not going to see those moments that are unscreened. You're only going to see those that are screened. When you do magnetization, you only see those vacancies, the moments that are screened with the saturation. So if you have vacancies that are, that are screened, you are just not going to see them. So, uh, so that's why you see this Curie behavior, because you're only looking at vacancies that are unscreened. And these guys are only looking at vacancies that are screened. So if you have both kinds, you're going to get two totally different results. So therefore, it's absolutely essential to have a global, uh, to have a local probe. OK. So let me. Uh, Oh, I th oh, OK, I have a summary of the whole thing at the end. So I'm, I'm done with this part. Now we can stop here, or we can go on to twisted graphene. I mean, it, you're the boss.
something like that, yeah. Are you guys too tired to, to continue or, or shall we go? What? To continue? Okay, let's, let's try to do it in, in 15 minutes, okay. So we're getting to twisted graphene. So now we're talking about the substrate, a changing the band structure with the substrate, not with defect, but with the substrate. Uh, now let's say that I have graphene here, a honeycomb structure, and I'm going to bring another uh, graphene uh, layer on top. Okay, and I'm putting it right on top. And now I'm going to start twisting it. Now, when you put two patterns on top of each other, you create a superstructure, which we call moiré. And I'm sure you've seen this take like two pieces of cloth or two patterns. Um, so the, the period of this moiré pattern is inversely proportional to sine of the rotation angle. Uh, OK, I'm going back. Now, as the angle becomes smaller and smaller, the period here kind of diverges. So you have a super period here, and I'm stopping at three degrees, okay? So you have a super period. So the bright parts are you have AA on top of each other, the dark parts are AB on top of each other, okay? Now this is something that people have known for a very long time. Um, so here is a sample that we have. This is a suspended CVD grown sample, and we have twisted layers in it. Uh, so this is a magnification of four. This is the moiré pattern. The twist here is 1.79 degree. We have a period of, of 7.5 nanometers. Clearly, these are not atoms. You zoom in to the atomic resolution. These are the atoms, okay? So we have a moiré pattern here. Uh, and we can go from moiré pattern to no, no moiré pattern at the boundary. And then we do, now, people have known about this moiré pattern ever since the STM was invented, the 90s. Moiré pattern in graphene. Everybody saw moiré pattern in graphene. Nobody thought about looking at spectroscopy. Everybody showed those patterns and said, OK. So we uh, kind of, decided, we always look at spectroscopy, so we looked at a spectroscopy. Uh, so now this, we take the spectrum outside the moiré pattern somewhere here. It looks kind of a regular graphene spectrum. And now we go inside the moiré pattern, boom, we see these huge peaks that appear. And those peaks are everywhere. No matter where you look, they're exactly the same on this twisted layer. And this was really puzzling. What's going on? The band structure has completely changed with this twist. And then we look at various angles, 1.16, the period is 12 nanometer, 1.8, 7.8, 3.5. So you see the period gets smaller and smaller as the angle becomes larger and larger. And then we do uh, uh, spectroscopy. And you see those peaks are always there. So the larger, the, smaller the, ang uh, the, larger the angle, the further apart they are. Here they are also, they're out of the, out of the uh, uh, range here. Uh, and the smallest one here, you see the peaks have merged. Not only have they merged, but there is a gap that opened, a 12 millivolt gap that opens here in this peak that merged. Okay, so let's see what's going on here. Now we've seen this way back, like in 2010. Okay, so here I'm taking two graphene layers, one on top of the other. In reciprocal space, here are the, the Dirac cones. So we have a pair here. Um, and so this is a pair of Dirac cones. The point where they intersect, uh, the, uh, they intersect at the energies in electron and hole sector that corresponds to the difference in the K, K vector, which is 2K sine theta 2. K is this big K here. Uh, so the distance here, the position of the energies, the energy where they merge goes like h bar vf delta k. It's proportional to sine theta 2. So the merging is important. Now, if there is no hybridization between the two layers, nothing happens. You just have two uh, independent graphene layers, and that's it. However, if you have some hybridization, if they're sufficiently close so that you allow tunneling between them, the, then you get a reconstruction of the band structure. 
So I'm showing you here that I'm going to a larger angle, so the energy where they cross, of course, increases, increases like sine theta over two. But if you have hybridization, and the energy scale of hybridization, let's call it W, you create this, this you create a saddle point in the band structure. And that's the energy now that separates the two saddle points is the original crossing minus the interaction energy. And this is the actual density of state done with, uh, uh, this was done with tight binding. Okay. So if you have a saddle point in the density of states, it's a flat region in the, in the band structure that gives you a peak in the density of state. It's called Van Hoff singularity. So if you have a, so, so the density of state that corresponds to these saddle points is a peak, and this position of the peak is going to follow the position of the saddle point. And the, this is our data, this is our the calculation, and they fit pretty well. This is for 1.79 degrees. So this is what's going on. You get, you get reconstruction of a band structure due to this twist. Uh, so now here, this is a small, very, very small angle. What happens at small twist angles? So when the twist angle is very small, your moiré pattern is going to be huge. The period becomes huge. Uh, this is 1.08 degrees. This is the density of state map. These points are AA. The A atom in, in, in the top graphene is sitting on top of A atom in the bottom graphene. The dark region is AB like that. And this is the Brillouin zone. You have a moiré Brillouin zone. This is the small segment here, which, which, which does all the new physics. So this is at one K point, and this is at the other K point. So in, in the moiré, in the twisted graphene, these are the Brillouin, this is the Brillouin zone that matters. This one, you have to forget about it. Uh, one very important thing is um, these small angles that, at the magic angle that I'm going to get to, this huge, there's about 13,000 atoms per unit cell, it's impossible to calculate this exactly. So you have to do all sorts of tricks. Uh, and, and, and you're going to see lots of papers that calculate the band structure, and you get different results because you do different approximation, and we have no idea who's right. We only know that what's going to happen, the bands are going to flatten. So here, um, so here is what I showed you before, the flatten, the the saddle point, and now I'm getting them closer and closer. The saddle points get closer and closer, and the band get flatter and flatter. Let me show you an animation here of what's going on as a function of angle. So I'm, angle is decreasing, decreasing, and when flat band. So when W is exactly equal to H bar VF delta K, you get a flat band. And now you go even smaller angle, it opens up again. And then again, you're going to get a flat band. So flat band happens when these things touch. You get a flat band. And we really like flat band in condensed matter because that's where correlations happen. So, um, OK, so the magic angle is where these two touch, and that happens. Now, we don't know exactly what W is, but W, if you take it from the uh, tunneling in bilayers, in actual bilayers, people put in a, a, about 100 millivolts, and they get this magic angle of 1.09 degrees. Uh, another thing that happens when you get to smaller angles, the because the bands become flatter, your Fermi velocity is renormalized. It becomes smaller, and we actually measure the Fermi velocity as a function of angle using Landau level spectroscopy. And, uh, and we found these points. Um, theoretically, it should go like this. So you see that really, when you go to a very small angle, the whole thing stops. They just, you have a completely flat band, your quasi particles don't move anymore. Uh, so, and at the time when we did this, we had no idea what's going to happen here. I mean, because in some sense it has to be singular, because at some points it becomes a bilayer, and you have a totally different band structure. However, when you're at more than 10 degrees, you recover the single-layer graphene 
band structure, and we use that in order to screen the uh, random potential in the substrate. So we use two layers, large angle, and that gives you a much cleaner uh, sub, uh, STM. So why do we like flat bands is when the energy scale of the electron-electron interaction is comparable to the bandwidth, that's what you care about, correlation, correlation effects become dominant. And uh, so when you put your Fermi energy at half filling of a flat band, you get all sorts of good stuff, superconductivity, magnetism, topological insulator, and so on and so forth. The Coulomb energy now has, in the, has the uh, Moiré period in it, lambda squared here. So it goes down as you decrease the angle, but the bandwidth goes down much faster. Uh, so this is our data here. So we, we actually were almost at the magic angle. We saw a gap opening at the Fermi energy of about 12 millivolts. OK, so these are the results that were published in March by the MIT group. So what they did, they actually tuned the twist to the magic angle, and they were looking for interesting effects that are going on. It took them a very long time to get there. Um, but they, f they were able to find some very, cool it down. You had to, they had to cool it down to dilution temp uh, refrigerator temperatures, and they found the following, what I have here. <clears throat> so uh, one thing to, to remind you, I mean, we have a super period. The Moiré period is now like your new crystal. So a full band is when you have uh, one electron per Moiré unit. Now, if you have a degenerate of four, it would be four, Moiré, four electrons per Moiré unit, right? Very, very low density. In graphene, we have a degeneracy of four, so the full band would be four electrons per per more cell. So you have to really tune your density, very low density, to see those things. Half full is going to be two electrons per, per more uh, period. And the more period, remember, it's, it's many nanometers. It's uh, like, I don't know what it is here, like 20 nanometers, 15 nanometers or so. OK, so they tuned it there. And here you have the carrier density. Uh, this is. Uh, uh, and this is half full. There should be an NS over 2. Half full band here on the electron side, half full band on the whole side. This is conductance, and you see that it goes to 0. So they have an insulating phase here. Uh, and this is done. This is what I call poor man's STM. Uh, but you see definitely there is a, there is a gap here, and, uh, uh, which goes away with magnetic field for some reason. Um, they, um, they can measure the gap size by, uh, with Arrhenius plots by, by looking at the temperature dependence. And on the two sides here, on, on the two sides of the insulator on the whole side, they see superconductivity. So they see that and they say it's superconductivity because it screens magnetic field, it's, uh, it disappears by magnetic field. and. Uh, and the resistivity goes to zero. So you see they have two domes on the, ele on the electron doped side of the insulator, on the whole doped side of the insulator. So this resembles uh, high TC superconductors a lot, except that unlike in high TC superconductors, we can walk through this, this phase diagram without making a new sample for every point, without chemistry. You just do it with, uh, with a gate. Uh, and, uh, okay, what did I miss here? Okay, the maximum TC is 1.7 Kelvin. And an important criterion for, uh, for the ki what kind of coupling you have is the ratio of TC to the Fermi energy. And the ratio here places it flat into the uh, strong coupling regime, exactly like high TC superconductors. Uh, so here is the, here they have a plot of, uh, the chemical potential versus Fermi temperature. Uh, this is where the high TC superconductors lie. Um, this is magic angle graphene, their measurement. And high TC, YBCO is here, BISCO is here. So it's on this line here. So here they have TC over, over TF is about uh, 0.1. Uh, 
uh, yeah, point one. So that puts it really into the uh, strongly coupled regime. So this, of course, now everybody started working on this, theorists and experimentalists. The theories are much faster. Uh, as of a couple of weeks ago, I counted about 70 theoretical papers. Uh, and uh, there's, it's a, there's a zoo of scenarios that people uh, propose. So we want to know what's the pairing mechanism? What uh, are these Cooper pairs? What's the gap symmetry? What's the nature of the insulating phase? All these are open questions. A lot of work for both experimentalists and theorists. And that brings me to the end. So let me just summarize part four. So in this part, I talked about condo screening. Uh, so we have seen that condo screening in graphene does exist. It occurs about the critical coupling strength. Um, the magnetic moments in graphene we have seen can be tuned with a, with a gate or with a local curvature. So you have both mechanical or, or, and electrical control over your magnetic moment. Pretty unusual. Uh, if the coupling strengths, uh, so if you have J that varies on your sample, one of the conclusions from all these contradicting results that you cannot tell what's going on from a global measurement. You need a local measurement. And then the second part, uh, we talked about twisted graphene. So the band structure of bilayer graphene can be tuned by, by a twist with an angle. Um, at small twist, the density of state develops Van Hoff singularities, uh, which are very interesting because that's where correlations can be observed. At the magic angle, a flat band forms at the charge neutrality point. And if it's half full, you developed uh, an insulator. We don't know what that insulator is. And on the two sides, a superconducting phase. And that's the end. Thank you for your attention.